Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming, and thank you for staying, those of you who were here this morning. Um, as I was introduced, so I'm based here in Lancaster. I'm a senior lecturer in Social Futures. I'm also the director of the Institute for Social Futures, which was founded and is based here at Lancaster University. So what I want to share with you today is, is part of the work that I do in relation to the very title of this talk, which is Equitable Urban Futures in Areas of Transition. I am a historian, so I find useful looking into the past to get a sense of the continuities and changes, for example, to do in relation to the meanings we associate with particular words. So three of the keywords, the etymology of three of the keywords that I decided to use of, of, of for this title are, the first one is equitable, which is to do with events, situations, happenings that are characterized by justice, fairness, whether or not they're reasonable. Some of the earliest uses of these terms in the case of equitable dates back to the mid 17th century. Time, perhaps unsurprisingly, could potentially be said to have a longer history, dating back to 1400. Um, and we're related to this notion of the future and future tense and future times, times in the plural, plural which is very important, precisely because um, that's the very question of this series, the urban future series. And transition is perhaps a term that we're relatively familiar with, but it's useful to realize that it's been used for a long time. And one of the earliest uses dates back to the mid 16th century. And by 2015, what's interesting is that it starts to describe perhaps what, what we in the contemporary world of the early 21st century associate with the effects of the climate emergency, about which we heard quite a bit this morning. We know through the work of important international organizations like the United Nations Habitat Program that cities are going to play an essential role in futures that are more just, futures that are more equitable, inclusive, in particular to do with challenging um, the perhaps developments around air and water pollution, the climate emergency, but also a more sustaining and nurturing relationship between the built environment and nature. Next to the important work of organizations like the United Nations, I also think it is important for us to connect to very specific places and very specific people in, the, in those places. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about during this talk. So this is Francie Mina. She's a resident of an informal settlement in Cali, which is the third largest city in Colombia. She's a migrant. She was displaced by violence, aged um, 18. She migrated to the city for various reasons, one of which is because cities are perceived to be safer. Uh, cities are perceived to, play, to be places of opportunities to do with schooling, um, safety, employment, and more. And I met Francie as part of this project, the GREAT project. GREAT is an acronym, and it's a great project too. Uh, but GREAT stands for greeting, so we are using the noun GREAT as a verb. Greeting equitable urban futures in areas of transition. And we do that in two cities, in Cali, Colombia, and in Havana, in Cuba. So it's a very international and it's a very interdisciplinary collaboration across, a collaboration across four different institutions, academic institutions, and three different countries. So Lancaster is the lead institution on this project. We work closely with UCL, which is University College London, and the Universidad del Valle in Colombia, and the Technical University of Havana. The project is funded, some of you will recognize the term, but the project is funded by something called the Global Challenges Research Fund, by the UK Research and Innovation. This gives you a sense of where Cali and Havana are in Colombia and in Cuba, and similarly where the settlements that we're working with, the very specific communities we're working with, where they're based in each one of these, in each of these two cities. So where you see the number 18, that's where Francie lives. So that's the southwest of the city, southwest of Cali. In the case of Havana, we actually work, uh, work towards with communities towards the north, which is related to the port, industrial port city, uh, or city area, um, which has been scheduled for redevelopment for at least three decades. The way we structure the work we do within the GREAT project is around something we call public labs. And what that means is social laboratories for a variety of different publics to come together to debate, to raise questions, to discuss, to have a debate similar to the debate that we've been proposed to, to host today. And we do that around three main themes. Policy and urban planning, transport and mobility, and zero waste. And the publics obviously involve members of the great team, 
policymakers and authorities, members of the community, the Francis of the different communities that we're working with, as well as institutions, a variety of institutions and interest groups. The reason why we think working in contexts of informality, the reason why we think that it's important is to do because it raises the question around participation in consumer society and civic democracy, which in all of these cases is limited. So it's a very different kind of experience. The capacities and abilities you have to envision the future, urban in other words, change as a result of constraints in these environments. And you may be familiar with terms such as favelas, slums, the fact that these are area areas which are incomplete, often illegal, marginal, and so on and so forth. At the same time, we know as well how important the scale of the challenge is. So we're talking about in 2016, one billion people living in these informal settlements, which is to say one in four urban residents. So it's a very, very significant um, uh, challenge. The concepts that we're using to engage with these contexts of informality are very much transitions, uh, intersectionality, and imaginaries of change. Transitions means something very different in Colombia than what it does in Cuba. In Colombia, it is to do with transition to peace, so it is transitional justice, um, and this is following the signing in 2016 of a peace, a ceasefire agreement between the Colombian government and the FARC, which is one of the largest um, guerrillas active since the 1950s, the late 1950s in Colombia, but also across, uh, well, active in Colombia mostly, but recognized across Latin America. In Cuba, transition has got nothing to do with transition to peace, but transition to a new constitution, which was launched in 2016, the turn of 20, uh, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2020, with a view to perhaps like th rethinking the socioeconomic structure of a country that has been facing um, a US embargo for about 60 years. Intersectionality, in turn, allows us to raise questions around gender, race, ethnicity, class, and in the case of Colombia, about whether or not the residents of these settlements have been the victims of the armed conflict. Imaginaries of change, in turn, actually allows us to capture, understand, and try and capitalize on the views of the future that these communities have, so that we recognize to what extent uh, plans for the future of cities like Cali and Havana do, do take into account what these visions are. So I'm going to illustrate very briefly how we're doing that in connection to one of these public labs, namely the public lab on zero waste. So we have run a series of workshops with communities over a period of um, 18 months. The project has is, is been 24, 26 months into the running. We started in April 2020, but because of COVID and a, a series of other restrictions, our fieldwork has been limited to an extent. At the same time, what we've realized in having conversations around solid waste management practices, for example, what we realize is that the, the, the very definition of what constitutes waste should start with the communities themselves. And asking questions about what to do, where to do it, in other words, at the level of the household or in relation to public spaces, to the community as, a, as, as such, what exactly are the priorities that every household and every individual is willing to, to take on board, to what extent there needs to be support by local authorities and other interest, interest groups and so on. These are conversations that we've been having together with the communities themselves. And I hope this image gives you an, a sense of what that transition means. So one very important realization is to do with the role of women in all of this. And it feels slightly contrived, the fact that I'm not a woman, but the fact that I'm representing the voices of this wonderful uh, residents of this community is precisely to do with the practices that they've been doing for at least 10 to 15 years. So this is, uh, there's the, the element connected to gender. The second element is that it's, it is intergenerational, which is not to say on the, only the other, older women are actually responsible for some very interesting practices around zero waste. And those range from composting, sorry, um, uh, composting, yes, uh, to do with the growing of plants for medicinal but also use in their kitchens, as well as repurposing copper wires to produce handbags and a variety of different products. And this is Marianita, so who is one of those uh, women. And she is an older woman with some physical um, disabilities. Uh, she didn't complete school, primary school. She does not qualify herself or portrays herself as a member of any particular ethnic group. 
And at the same time, she's actually been able to create a network of older people in her community to work on recycling and to do so and has done so very successfully. And this is a figure that is important to recognize, which is, in her case, she produces 230 grams of waste per day. And the reason why that is important is, we, is because if we contrast that with what is happening in her community, in the district number 18, she actually produces less than half what the community does, less than a third than the city does. In the UK, the figure per capita is around 1.2 to 1.4 kilograms per capita. So she's actually very close to the net zero targets that we hear about in different contexts, political and otherwise. The map on the, on the right gives you a sense of the pattern across these, these communities that we're working with, which is to say they are representative of important practices that we need to learn from. I think one of the main goals and what I think the great project is doing in cities like Cali as well as Havana is to understand and recognize practices and ideas and dreams in some cases about what constitutes a future that is more equitable and more just. And the reality is that we need to start with people like Marianita and people like Francie in order to recognize that the barriers that they experience and have experienced um, for years can be removed in order to create a more inclusive environment to shape futures that actually are congruent with the transitions that the likes of Marianita and Francis need in future. Thank you. <laughs>